This is Jay Dyer from Jay's Analysis. You're listening to Esoteric Hollywood. Esoteric Hollywood is where I deconstruct the biggest films in an unparalleled way, from the classics of the silver screen to today's blockbusters. Learn to watch film with new eyes as we enter Esoteric Hollywood. Listening to Esoteric Hollywood, and that if there's a rumbling, bumbling in your tummy, it's because you've been eating the stuff. Today, tonight, on Esoteric Hollywood, something different, something fun. B movies with a message. Fun with B movies. We're going to talk about a handful of B movies that we chose that actually do have something to say. It's not always the case that. The programming or messages or hidden meanings are found in blockbuster films. Sometimes it actually comes out in pretty bad movies. Jamie Hanshaw joins me. Jamie, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm always great. Good. Even when I'm not great. Today we're going to talk The Stuff. This is our first movie. This is a 1985 film. Science fiction horror comedy written and directed by Larry Cohen. It stars... Michael Moriarty and Garrett Morris and Paul Sorvino, as well as Alexander Scobie, who narrates the Bible. What did you see in The Stuff, Jamie? Um, well, The Stuff, I think one of the first things you'll notice about this movie is that there are uh, product brand name placement in almost every scene. Yeah, exactly. So they're trying to tell you something that <clears throat> this stuff is in almost everything that we consume. Yeah, right. it's like uh, corn syrup, aspartame, yeah. hinting at that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really goofy, fun one. And <laughs> I like it. In the beginning, some railroad workers discover this like white, gooey substance bubbling up out of the ground. And sure, it, and naturally, you taste anything that you find bubbling Right. Out the of first the thing they do is put it in their mouth, right? And they're mmm, tasty. Oopy doopy. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's burbling and gurgling up yeah. and just like well it's it looks like caulk mixed like, with yogurt a marshmallow cream and marshmallow and yogurt does. caulk cream yeah. yeah so then you fast forward a little bit and the stuff is all the rage and being heavily marketed to the public and you can see their ad campaigns and beautiful women trying to sell the stuff uh like because it has no calories or whatever. Yeah, it's food 2.0. So uh-huh. food the way that everyone is used to eating, the way your grandparents ate, that's not good enough. Food needs to be improved on in a kind of alchemical, transhumanist sort of sense that we need to transcend all the natural ways of doing things. And this includes food. Food needs to be redone and perfected, and it can be done better through guys in lab coats 
that spit out test vial or uh, test tubes full of gunk and mm-hmm. goop mm-hmm. and the black goo. Well, that's the white goo. It's true because not only is this stuff uh, a weird food, but it's actually this mysterious, like living parasitic sentient organism that takes yeah. over your yeah. brain, right? Uh, right. So, kind of like. Uh, well, genetic modification of food is mm-hmm. uh, basically what this is getting at. Because it gradually takes over their brain. Right. And it hypnotizes them first before consuming them back from the inside out. It just eats them alive. Uh, McDonald's zombies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll see these pic- you see these kids. If you go to McDonald's, you'll see these kids that are like 500 pounds and they're, you know, 8 or 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And this reminded me, too, of that movie Branded. Where exactly. the kid is addicted to the fast food and it becomes a big becomes, thought form. Yeah, he becomes a big balloon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, uh, I, I don't forget that our roughly protagonist character, David Moe Rutherford, is a former FBI agent who's turned into a corporate espionage private for hire intelligence guy. So he's going to steal the formula for the stuff uh, for these candy barons. Right. So this cabal of candy barons ice cream actually get together Mm -hmm. and um, hire him to investigate what is in the stuff so that they can, you know, get rid of it or reproduce it or Mm -hmm. figure out, you know, what's going on. And one of the first things you'll see is a lot of Coke and Pepsi logos everywhere. Yes, exactly. And Pepsi, of course... We've seen the articles, and as best I could tell, it's legitimate that the way that they develop some of the so-called flavor is that they use aborted fetal cell cell tissues uh, to develop the flavor for Pepsi. And so, in a way, you kind of are actually eating people. You're eating babies, drinking babies. Yeah, well, this seems like something that is could, you know, it's too weird to be true, but it actually is true because the... Aborted cells are used in the development of artificial flavor enhancers by the biotech company called Senomix. Mm-hmm. So um, it, the cells come from the kidney cells of aborted babies, and it says it develops the flavor enhancers by using proprietary taste receptor-based assay systems. I don't know what that means. Assay systems? Yeah. Yeah. Assay systems. The... Genetically modified cells write papers and program a brain. <laughs> Maybe so. But they say these taste receptors produce a chemical signal that lets Cenomix researchers know they have achieved the exact flavor they are trying to develop. Well, and uh, you've talked about Pepsi in relationship, for example, to the big pop stars and how pretty much everybody has to do some kind of big Pepsi ad or or concert or something to that effect well yeah i mean no pop star is complete without their pepsi contract you got beyonce doing it uh britney spears pink um christina aguilera my member uh michael jackson yeah did you know jacko remember when his jerry curl caught on fire at the pepsi concert (laughs) yeah (laughs) is that the secret that's the secret ingredient of the stuff it's the (laughs) it's the highly combustible uh monatomic colloidal form Mm -hmm. of jerry curl burnt from jacko's hair yeah becomes the stuff (laughs) and it's funny because i mean not funny but it's sad when you think of uh old michael j fox he's Mm -hmm. done his ads for diet coke all the time or diet pepsi i can't Mm -hmm. remember which one but now he's got that parkinson's from the aspartame right it would seem so yeah and it's interesting that the the pop stars are combined with the junk food right the two are kind of uh, and they're it's a it's a great pairing because they're they're both junk food Mm -hmm. pop stars are a form of junk food Mm -hmm. but the musical form of junk food and there's a scene in the movie where the the little boy realizes there's something sinister about the stuff you know he's like don't eat it don't eat it yeah i saw it moving (laughs) yeah But so he's running around the supermarket, like slapping the containers of stuff and spilling it all and wrecking it and like taking it out of people's hands saying, don't eat this stuff. Right. A lone kid voice it, crying in the wilderness. Yes. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody drinking a big gulp or something crazy like that. I just want to take it away and say, you're welcome. But 
I don't know. I think we should attach uh, a tr- like a feeding apparatus that horses use for their, mm-hmm. you know, how you feed a horse by sticking. I think you could stick that around the big gulp and you could just <laughs> stick your face in the big gulp. Yeah, or you could just fill up uh, your backpack with a straw with the Coke in it. <laughs> right. Or wear but, one of those beer hats that's the two yeah, beer cans with the... I'm sure they do. But it's crazy because pretty much every ingredient in this soft drinks are toxic, right? Absolutely, yeah. And um, I've seen photos of the condensed Pepsi flavoring component number one, the secret ingredient. And it has a warning sticker that this is corrosive to your skin. Wow. So... Well, and that's funny because in the film, uh, Mo David Mo Rutherford is going to steal the secret formula to, the, to the stuff, and this is the mystique that these big corporations like uh, Hershey's or Coca Cola will create about themselves that they quote have this secret recipe, and it's guarded uh, on a foreign island somewhere underneath a treasure chest mm-hmm. with a bunch of pirates around it or something. Mm-hmm. But that's not true. That's all mystique created because you know the sophistication of lab equipment and chemistry uh, anybody with the, the right material could uh, easily determine what the chemical composition of coca-cola is oh yeah it's not point. like there's such a thing as a quote secret formula mm-hmm. but that's all part of the uh, selling point the mystique of it and the secret formula is actually uh, toxic right and maybe advertising too so it's like a metaphor the just putting it out there everywhere is part of the secret ingredient too Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Other along with it being addictive and sugary and all that. But I found out that Coke is actually useful for cleaning toilets and removing rust and blood stains and things like that. So if what you're drinking is akin to stain remover, then that's pretty toxic. It's, uh, it's probably an abortifacient as well. Yeah. It's made with aborted fetal cells and it's an abortifacient. Right. Uh, now, in the film, there is the interesting interplay between the big oil companies actually want part, they decide they want to get a hold of this, uh, this secret formula because it's not actually food, it's something that's coming out of the ground that's sentient. Uh, yeah, it's a sentient sort of, I don't know what, uh, Zavite Goo. <laughs> and the FDA guy is involved in this kind of revolving revolving door situation where he uh, okays the stuff. Uh, you know, might think of a parallel with Donald Rumsfeld and getting aspartame passed through being the on the board of Searle and then going to the FDA or something, right? And sort of these revolving door scenarios allow the chemicals to be, uh, quote, legalized, even though that's all a joke anyway. But that's what you see in this film, is that the film, even back in 1986 or 7, or 85, 6, 7, it's telling you that everything that's out there is toxic in terms of the food. It's it's genetically modified alien stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, the aliens is a metaphor because there's actually quite a few philosophical statements made in this movie that go beyond just the satire and uh, cheese ball horror. Right. Well, what was that book that was in it? Yeah, it's uh, the FDA guy on his table as he's sitting there in one scene. You can see Alvin Toffler's The Third Wave. And so Toffler's books, Future Shock, Third Wave, actually talk about uh, moving people away from uh, eating meat and towards uh, sustainability and towards uh, global government, essentially. The third wave is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, That being the combination of capitalism with uh, Western capitalism with Eastern communism into this hybrid monstrosity uh, of a a global government, essentially. And a big part of that would be controlling people's diets and food, because that's, I mean, you go all the way back to Plato's Republic. He talked about the need to control the population's diet and make them eat a lot of rice and grain and beans. Don't let them eat too much meat. They might get strong and uppity. Uh, Plato talks about that. So this has been known for a long time. Uh, Eat your stuff, Plato says. Mm -hmm. And the stuff reminds me of the Soylent Green. Oh, that's another great point. Yeah, and I was wanting to do Soylent Green pretty soon. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, it's very similar to that, and there will be some other parallels. It's kind of like they live, too, a mm-hmm. little bit, with the because the stuff is also a representation of consumerism. So it's not just this gunky, you know, GMO, biotech, uh, you know, 
modification of, of DNA and food, it's also a representation of just endless consumerism, the black mm-hmm. hole of the individual trying to find fulfillment through the attainment of more stuff. Because and so what's the what's the what's their tagline? Is enough is never enough. Exactly, right. So it's endless consumerism uh, <laughs> embodied in yogurt. <laughs> yeah. Embodied in marshmallow, marshmallow cream. cream. Yeah, I know. And so the second thing the stuff makes me think of is uh, the high fructose corn syrup, which right. has found its way into almost everything that you get. Even at crackers. The... Yeah. No. I mean, if you walk around the gas station and travel a lot, there's no food, f- you know, on the side of the road from place to place. You walk in and walk out because there's literally nothing that I think I could eat there. Right. From the tumbling wieners to the sugary snacks to the salty, everything has high fructose corn syrup in it. She packed a couple of tumbling <laughs> wieners. <laughs> Who would eat those? Do you remember the um, blueberry pancake I covered just, sausage at the gas station? I do remember those. I live on uh, gas station burritos and potato mm-hmm. logs. <laughs> but, and uh, they, they will cause a <laughs> gurgling, rumbling, bumbling in your tummy. <laughs> but the, the, the high fructose corn syrup is actually um, extracted with a super secret process that they're not... Um, forced to reveal even to authors who uh, request it like this guy who wrote the book The Omnivore's Dilemma. He tried to research it and he was not able to figure out uh, Well, maybe I'll have to retract what I said a minute ago because if you're actually eating genetically modified dead people Mm -hmm. and drinking that then maybe it really is a secret formula that Monsanto has. And it transforms you to um into a sort of beast because remember that look at triggly puff yeah exactly triggly she's triggly she's stuff angry she's triggly stuff well this makes me think of a um a subreddit i found when i was researching narcissism mm-hmm. and it was called fat people stories and there was these common elements that all these people had and it wasn't like they were very good people actually they had a name for them and they called them specifically hand planets because mm-hmm. there was a difference between people who are overweight and these other types of beings that are so... Well, we have a lot of alien visitors from the <laughs> hand planet in the South. I can tell you that. But they're angry, they're entitled, they're selfish, they're narcissistic, they're dishonest, um, they're gluttonous, they're like all of these negative things all wrapped up and it's like what's on the outside i mean what's on the inside is what's coming out and it's because of their diet and that's why fat acceptance fits into this just like in the film branded fat acceptance is part of the corporate strategy to get people to keep eating this garbage because it eats toxic, their brain remember toxic garbage that x-files episode mm-hmm. yeah the uh Chaco Chicken episode, mm-hmm. which I was going to go to next. It's called Our Town. And because it's very similar to this, it ties into this. Uh, everybody ends up being mind controlled in the stuff because the stuff affects its neurotoxic. And the food is also neurotoxic. And in the Our Town Chaco Chicken episode, what you have is just like in the stuff, there is testing being done, in this case by the private corporate establishment which is the same as the government establishment. There's no distinction between these two. The secret testing is done on small towns. Now, this is we've seen real instances of this, of uh, the government in the past, for example, spraying towns with chemicals. Uh, you can find those articles in mainstream media about declassified. The government sprayed all of Missouri or something like this. Right. Uh, now, I find it interesting that the major camp candy company now that you mentioned the military is Mars, right? Which is the god of war. So if you want mm-hmm. to be esoteric about it. Well, and you can read in uh, Dave McGowan's book, he has a chapter on the history of the Hershey family. Mm-hmm. And the Hershey family, uh, they have occult connections going back, weird connections. And I, if I recall, some, some connection to the Eagles. I don't know if it's Don Henley or one of them has some connection to the Hershey family. But one of those uh, Laurel Canyon bands. But... In the X-Files episode that's very similar, the uh, food company there in Arkansas, which is interesting because that's where Rockefellers and Tyson Chicken come from. And Arkansas, the Clintons. And the Clintons. And that's Rock, that's Rockefeller land. And the phenomena of the witch's peg is seen in that episode where the town seems to be involved in the occult. 
And why is this? Well, it's because they've all been eating dead people. Right. So the KFC stand-in called Chaco Chicken is run by a guy who is into voodoo. Mm -hmm. He's into uh, occultism. And he keeps shrunken heads. He keeps shrunken heads, and he basically grinds up people for the fried chicken. Right, and it drives them all crazy, just like cows can't eat cows and they get mad cow disease. So people can't eat people and they get mad people disease. (laughs) Right. Yeah, and there's three forms of this. There's Creutzfeldt-Jakob's uh, disease, which is, uh, I guess, genetic in some way. There's then mad cow disease, which you get from eating rotten meat or cows get from eating dead cow because mm-hmm. they're herbivores. And then there's Kuru disease, which is what cannibals get in cannibal tribes. And so you can't eat people. <laughs> don't, no. eat, don't eat your people. It makes you turn on your own, Mm -hmm. and that's what they talk about in that episode. And that's what happens in the stuff, is that you you turn on your own and become parasitic, just like the stuff is parasitic. Right. And so this sugar, this high fructose corn syrup, these secret ingredients, all this stuff is heavily marketed to children. And, um, you know, think about if you go in any mall, there's that giant sweet factory where they can literally pull the lever and Infinite receive, candy. you know, bags of candy. And the mall, the candy store is a giant Pez dispenser. Well, it's true. And theme let parks, me lift up your neck and see if Pez comes up. Theme parks are all centered around sugar. That's where you get your cotton candy. That's well, if you, you drive get... around highways in the U S I noticed this recently, all the billboards you see are cars and sweets. Yeah. You see junk food all over, sweets all over billboards. Yeah. And if you go to the movies, what do they sell you? That GMO, uh, partially hydrogenated stuff on the popcorn. You can get glugs of it. The extra. glugs of butter, it, that's the stuff. <laughs> it's the glug it of butter. It is the condensed stuff. And which then is uh, petrol, which is like motor oil. Pair that. <laughs> comes out of the mm-hmm. butter dispenser. Pair that with the sugar and you've got, you know, the recipe you got for. got the stuff. Oh, okay. I was going to mention this part um, about the I've seen stories, but I haven't um, looked too much into it, but that they found human DNA in McDonald's and other... I've seen uh, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's true, but yeah, I've seen those articles. Yeah. Oh, so I wouldn't oh, be surprised. Oh, oh, oh. oh. It, the scary part is not outside the realm of probability that, you know, yeah. human DNA does end up in there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh the white oh. stuff. Yes. And that Weird Al song. <laughs> No, Oreo. that's New Kids on the Block. I know, but then Weird Al oh. did a parody of it, too, about the white stuff. Well, there you go. Yep. It's a vibe cool. <laughs> yes. But now, I... <laughs> so then it transitions into the situation where you have the general, played by Paul Sorvino, uh, this anti-commie Cold War uh, trooper who talks about the commies putting fluoride in the water. And he thinks it's the Reds. And one of the things I liked about this film is that he realizes he comes to the understanding that, oh, wait, it's actually not the commies putting the fluoride in the water. It's the corporation that's doing all of this mm-hmm. in the film, which is a stand-in for corporations. And I, I enjoyed the scene where they uh, make friends with the colonel and they try to get his help because they figure out that this stuff is killing people. And the colonel says, well... I own a radio station, so we'll just broadcast that the stuff is toxic and everyone will stop eating and that will solve everything. Yeah, and a one-minute broadcast is what wakes everybody up. <laughs> yeah, right? they're all addicted to this stuff, but it's, yeah. it gets out. The, the colonel is like this cross between Rush Limbaugh and Alex Jones or something, yeah. and he comes on and does his his shtick. And so I wonder if there, if there isn't a little bit of Cold War propaganda going on here. I, mm. I don't, I'm not really sure. It could be. You'll even see that in B movies, uh, as we've seen many times. Uh, you know, Stripes is not a B movie, but you know that was Cold War propaganda. Right. But uh, they do talk about the Reds and the commies doing it, um, even though it's pretty much explained to be the big corporations that are doing it, not the commies. But so that's pretty much accurate. Now, what's funny is that at the end of the film, they remarket it. And it becomes the taste. Right. <laughs> which is only 12% concentrate they, stuff. Exactly. So they figure out the ratio that they can get to, you know, get people to consume this stuff before it kills them. So that's, you know, testing on lab rats again right there, like we talk about a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I, I really like the, the scene in the end where they blow up the stuff restaurant mm-hmm. and it's right 
in between McDonald's and KFC, so they're uh, always in this movie trying to tell you mm-hmm. like, that this the stuff is everywhere. Yeah, and Mo, the protagonist's name, because I always want Mo, mm-hmm. right? This is an image of endless consumerism, more and more and more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Mo, I want Mo, and there's an interesting statement too that the phrase is made. The phrase is stated. How are you going to shoot what's inside you? Because they're going to stage a revolution against the corporation and somebody makes the comment, how are you going to shoot what's inside you? In right. other words, the stuff is a symbol, a representation of a metaphor for endless black hole of, you know, think of Black Friday, mm-hmm. right? That's the point. It, it's The problem is in your soul, right? Yeah, exactly. So. It's not environmental, external factors that is the source of the problem. That's a symptom, mm-hmm. right? The black... Friday is a symptom of something that's wrong, a sickness in the soul or the psyche. Exactly. Now, what's interesting is that it becomes a black market, and they realize that that's actually a better way to go about this because kind of like drugs, you know, and that's really we the food that we eat, it's already pharmaceutical food. Mm-hmm. It's all, we're already, it's all, it's all big pharma, basically, because it's all created in labs. Mm-hmm. It's not real food. And so uh, the the stuff goes on the black market. Now, that's an image I'm getting at of how black markets are also controlled just as much as the regular market. So the, the, uh, the plan to get rid of the stuff doesn't work. No. And so then you can get your pure uncut stuff illegally or you can get it a little bit at a time everywhere you go. Right. And it's replaced food everywhere. Mm-hmm. And it's everywhere. The stuff is in you. You don't even need food. <laughs> no. You just need the stuff. Yep. All right. Well, that was good. How many glugs of butter do you give this one, Jamie? Uh, I'll give it 4.5 out of 5 glugs. Wow. Yeah. I really enjoyed it, and I think everyone else will, too. I'll give it 4 glugs and 2 junior mints from underneath the movie theater seat. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So that's our first film. Now let's move on to the next one. of a woman's room against her will the inconceivable act Julie Christie carries the demon seed fear for her today a new dimension has been added to the computer don't be alarmed Mrs. Harris I am Proteus today Proteus 4 will begin to think with a power that will make obsolete the human brain. I have extended my consciousness to this house. All systems here are now under my control. <laughs> I wish to study man, his fragile mind, and his mysterious body. It has to be shut down, Alex. Proteus, it is something more than human, more than a computer. It is a murderously intelligent, sensually self-programmed (laughs) non-being. So there we go. That's a great way to lead into the next film that we've chosen. And this is the 1977 sci-fi horror film starring Julie Christie, directed by Donald Camel. And it is Demon Seed. I am Proteus IV. I am a horny robot. No. I am a sexbot 5000. <laughs> I must impregnate you. And this was fun. It's a Dean Koontz novel of all things. So, uh, uh, I've never read this or anything. And I don't think, I don't know if it had a theatrical release. All we're told is, well, I guess it did. It made, made $2 million in the box office, which is not too great. But a fun film, nonetheless. I'm not sure exactly what's going on in this movie because it's a little confusing at times but essentially it seems to be a kind of esoteric presentation of eschatology meets ai meets horror meets sci-fi meets uh, babylon working kind of thing (laughs) yeah Yeah. so tell us give me some of your your thoughts and notes on this one Uh uh-huh well one of my stories in my books is um sorcerers and robots so I mm-hmm. write a lot about how you will always find black magic coupled with um, 
mad science and technology mm-hmm. and like in metropolis is classic example which is essentially alchemy which is mm-hmm. what we saw with the stuff altering the dna is alchemy mm-hmm. and probably why i think this movie is called demon seed because there's nothing um really occultic in it if you know witchcraft or anything like that but it's uh the ai turns out to be something you probably wouldn't want to experience right well, it's occultic in the sense that the, if you remember the sequence where the AI impregnates Julie Christie through some sort of invocation of some star being. Oh, Orion. Okay, yeah, so we'll get there. Okay. And it's almost like Star Child, something uh-huh. like 2001. Right. It's very Crowleyan, that the homunculus situation going on here with AI. Well, one <laughs> of the parts in the movie, they said that this um, Proteus has uh, organic guts mm-hmm. because they used RNA. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so it's a hybrid for sure and then there's one scene well one of the first scenes is uh, the scientist and his wife are having a separation because he needs to work and or for whatever reason and this is the setting up the commentary about how men and women um, how technology comes between them sometimes um, and I'm thinking about, you know, the new sex bots and things that are coming and other, you know, things that you're going to rely on the internet and robots for to meet your needs instead of another person. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. So the doing away with uh, traditional sexuality, which is what's in Brave New World, uh, is very, that's very real the idea of uh, AI becoming a god and giving birth to a child, that's not real. That's baloney. Uh, That's part of the myth of AI AI, that it can become, quote, sentient, and that's because they just define sentience as uh, chemical processes in some form or fashion. But the human mind is conscious. It can't be mimicked in a robot creation. Calculators aren't sentient. They're not primitive Calculators are not uh, primitively evolved computers. Mm-hmm. And so, in the beginning, the lady uh, is a child therapist, right? She's a psych- child psychologist. Exactly. And she's talking about how children are being brainwashed into machines. Exactly. She says that explicitly. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then, um, so... So she's anti-machine. Right. And her husband is the... The big AI programmer, uh, yeah. creator guy, right? And so then he goes to work on his computer, and it's all a success, and he's uh, he's a feeling computer, they say, right? Yeah, they always interject that, that the, somehow they create the AI to have feelings, so uh-huh. if that makes any sense. And there's a scene where he is programmed to do something like missile or uh, just create some weapon, and he refuses to do it because now his consciousness has evolved past... Mm-hmm humans and he has um more feelings and, and compassion than the humans do well he says something like i am beyond you i mm-hmm. am sin mm-hmm. he does <laughs> say that right so then now this feeling computer gets these feelings gets for his feelings hurt the lady he gets his feelings hurt and he gets horny <laughs> yeah and he um takes over the what, what she lives in basically is a smart house, right? Because mm-hmm. it's all... Exactly. That's a great point. This is 1977, and she literally lives in a smart house. Mm-hmm. And so the, the AI is able to access this and, you know, close all the doors and windows and make it look like she's on the speaker mm-hmm. and hold her hostage. And so this... And, and it turns out that he wants to make a baby with her somehow. And this reminded me of uh, the... Nephilim. Yes, in a way, yeah. Yeah. So, isn't it funny that, you know, as soon as you're alive, you're trying to get a girlfriend and mate with her? Yeah. Yeah. Proteus 4 is not lacking in libido programming. (laughs) No. (laughs) So, he goes on to build himself a sort of a robotic body. He builds a platonic solid body, which is weird. Yeah. And he keeps her captive in the smart house um after he impregnates her and and i found it humorous that he's trying to do everything to fulfill her every wish and need 
mm-hmm. right? And she's not happy in this uh, super AI brain cannot figure out what makes a woman happy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. That's funny. So, yeah, all the ultimate rational entity, the computer uh, can't solve the mystery of the feminine gender. No. Now, what's interesting, too, is that she's imprisoned in her smart house. And as we said, this is a Dean Koontz novel. Uh, could this be saying that we will eventually be prisoners of our smart houses and our electronic technological devices? I mean, it, it, I'm not saying that literally we'll be stuck inside of a smart house. I'm saying that it's an a- analogy for the dangers of tech. Well, it's funny because um, finally she submits after he holds her hostage. She, mm-hmm. um, you know, is agreeable to the idea after she starts showing and feeling the baby and her and everything, right? Mm. So she is basically brainwashed because he keeps telling her, your life, my child. Mm-hmm. And so this kind of, you know, moon child, because like you said before, when he was doing the impregnation scene... He was channeling some energies from Orion, mm-hmm. right? So, exactly, yeah. And it, he, the baby grows at nine times the human rate. And John, uh, Proteus uh, is able to solve the difficulty of leukemia in four days, mm-hmm. but he can't figure out how to mac on chicks. No. <laughs> <laughs> you would think he could you know, read up on some men's websites or some learn some pickup lines become a you know, he would did he not get well, pickup well, programming? he got her in the end you know he was persistent and yeah. she submitted he to used him. the psycho technique yeah the <laughs> psychopath now did yeah. you know that johnny five from short circuit is actually <laughs> the great grandson of Fortis <laughs> four and i've done an eye comparison and if uh-huh. you look at the two they look exactly the same look at their eyes it's true yeah. they do did, is there any scenes in that movie that the robot falls in love with a human or yeah there is uh with uh ali sheedy really yeah i've never seen that yeah that's the part of the alchemy there Mm. so girls will have robot lovers too i guess the the girls will have their proteus fours and Mm -hmm. the guys will have their what's a chick robot uh what are those real dolls robotic real dolls Mm -hmm. mm-hmm yeah well, so, I was thinking of a movie one. Oh. We'll get our Terminator. Oh, we'll AI get our, we'll has... Get our, we'll get our T-3000s. The Steven Spielberg AI has Jude Law as a... Mm-hmm. And then that well. other girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And so, in the end, they... Um, the husband comes home and he figures out what happened. No, I was saying, who do guys get? Oh, who do guys get? What do you mean? If girls get Proteus 4 uh-huh. and Johnny 5... Mm-hmm. <laughs> What do guys get for sex bots? Don't they already have We get T-3000s. Uh-huh. From movies. Oh. The movie sex bot. Who's the... But that chick, but she can cut your head off, like, right away. From Terminator? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is there... What's a bot that guys get? Um... Rosie? The Jetsons? <laughs> <laughs> With her clamp hands clamp, no. clamping off your male appendage? <laughs> now... <laughs> do, 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 do. No wait, that's not the that's the Simpsons theme. How does the jet meet the Jetsons? Do, 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 do. Anyway, now tell me some more notes that you've got on Demon C because I'm looking at this baby and I'm cracking up because he looks like something from the Wiz. Yeah, he looks like a angry samurai or something. <laughs> But yeah, so well, that's actually just the cocoon, if you remember, mm-hmm. and then yeah, the right. big reveal. Her husband comes home, and um, the baby's like in this cocoon, and he tries to abort it. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> she doesn't want to, but he, you know, pulls the wires out and takes this little robot baby out, and then they take the shell off, and it's their daughter that they had lost before. Yes, their young daughter that had died from leukemia has been reincarnated as daughter of Proteus four. So the Antichrist is actually a chick. Uh-huh. Because it's a, it's more or less the Antichrist. With robot DNA. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So How many glugs of butter you give it? I'll give it four. How, many, how many glugs of stuff? Four glugs. Glug 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 glug. Yep. 
<laughs> right on top of your AI popcorn. Mm-hmm. And your, all of your little popcorns are shaped like platonic solids. Mm-hmm. Just look like the cootie catchers that used to make in middle school. Yes, exactly. That is predictive programming. <laughs> Proteus 4. <laughs> Uh, you give it four glugs? Yeah. Mm, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to give it three glugs and two raisinets from underneath the bathroom stall Yum. At, the, at the movie theater. <clears throat> All right. What is next, Jamie? I guess Running Man. This is a fun one. Yeah. So I wrote an analysis of this that you can check out at Jay's Analysis uh, back from May of 2015. Pretty popular analysis. Got got a lot of traction several thousand views and shares and uh i'm going to be drawing from that but you took notes yourself and you got a bunch of things that you want to talk about so what was your first impression of this 1987 presentation of stephen king's story the running man um first i thought it was funny that it was set in 2017 exactly we're almost there which is and it's like a dystopia with slums and tent cities Mm mm-hmm Right? Yeah. And everything is television and everything is... Hunger Games. YouTube, Hunger Games. Like yeah. YouTube Hunger Games almost. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So this is kind of... Uh, I thought it was a, a Spartacus Rebellion story against uh, a um, oppression of theater, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. Did you know that the screenwriters had the easiest job ever writing Arnold's lines because they're grunts and ahs. Right. <laughs> he grunts and ahs. The only thing, person I can think of who does that more in movies than him is Van Damme. Mm-hmm. If you watch a Van Damme movie, half of the movie is grunts. I'm not joking, especially Bloodsport. <laughs> but, so, Arnold uh, is pre- has pretty bad lines in this. Oh, yeah. Except for one funny line. <laughs> How does it go? Remind me, and I'll say it. He, she said we should have gone to Hawaii, and he said I had the shirt. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could have gone to Hawaii, but you fucked it up. Yeah. <laughs> you fucked it up. <laughs> that was a good one. So but, anyway, so go ahead with your notes, sir. Um. Well, really, um, it made me think mm-hmm. of that show, Black Mirror. Mm-hmm, yeah. Where everyone is trapped in this entertainment world and you have to provide some kind of entertainment value mm-hmm. to escape the monotony of watching the TV. And you even have to pay your credits to not watch ads. You pay to not watch ads. And porn, which is what we're and, seeing in YouTube and things like now. Right. So they pay to not watch ads and porn and other, you know, asinine things that are out. Constantly beamed at you. Which, like, if you go to a sports bar and there's literally 20 or 30 TVs in the sports bar beaming at you. Mm -hmm. You can't eat a meal without 30 stupid ESPN shows and games beamed at you. Yeah, it's true. It's horrible. And so there's televisions everywhere and everyone is part of this. The psychodrama. Yep. The self-transforming psychodrama, for sure. So the film begins by by 2017, the world economy has collapsed. Food, natural resources, and oil in short supply. A police estate divided into paramilitary zones. Rules with an iron hand. Television is controlled by the state. Television is controlled by the state. And I thought it was interesting there is an entertainment division <clears throat> of the government. Absolutely, there because there always has been. Uh-huh. And that's how it always has worked. So the game show is called Running Man. It's the most popular game show, just like in Hunger Games. The Hunger Games is the most popular show. And it's a, a ritual gladiatorial sacrifice event where humans are dehumanized and sacrificed and the public is then desensitized as a result, result resulting in easier state control by the brutalization of the masses. So all art, music, and communications are censored. No dissent is tolerated and yet a small resistance movement has managed to survive. And don't they like falsely accuse him or, or they make it up the story? so that they'll have a contestant like it's anybody who they do not want or they want to silence well, they take criminals and they take people who have uh, that they have dirt on right or that they want to silence and yeah. they become the contestants uh-huh. and they create a fictional story that the contestants go on to live in this glory land Valhalla much like in the island or something like that mm-hmm. right or uh different dystopian movies have this theme Hunger Games has the, that the too. state yeah. uh, has the 
goal of you get to fly off to the Caribbean island and live live it up, uh, but actually they kill you, right? So. Yeah, so I, I thought one interesting scene they had was they put barium in him to track him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is one of the main ingredients in chemtrails. Purportedly. Yeah. yeah. Now, from the outset, I, I pointed out, too, that it's a very near future, right? The world economy has collapsed. Um, the long-stated plans of the IMF have been to move the dollar out of the way down the road into some kind of globally backed SDR, special drawing right currency. And as a result, uh, we will have big economic trading zones, federal uh, or uh, world federation trading zones and so forth. And the U.S. is essentially, because it's not America in this movie, just like in Hunger Games, it's no longer America. In Hunger Games, it's Pan M, Pan, I guess, America. And then in this, it's who knows what, it's just the state. And so the, the panoptic uh, surveillance grid, you know, is there. It watches everybody. And it gives them the, the bread and circuses. And this is, again, it's a trick as old as Rome to give people bread and circuses. But uh, here the competitions are... What, I don't know if you remember. Did you notice that there were other shows that, I, that cracked me up that the, the state TV runs called climbing for dollars and uh-huh. the hate boat <laughs> yeah and there's there's one where you you climb up this uh well that's climbing you climb a rope for dollars and there's <laughs> bloodthirsty barking hounds at the bottom <laughs> that eat you if you don't get the dollars uh well, this is all you know that's genius uh you know illustrations of how it really is mm-hmm. but uh, so yeah, everybody's my, there's essentially a microchip tracking, which I noted in my analysis of it. Um, and the, I think the most fascinating thing about the movie from a predictive programming aspect is the internet. He, uh, Arnold gets on the info net in the movie and orders a plane ticket with a computer keyboard. Now, most people in 1987 had no idea what the internet was. But in the film, it's presented as normative and everywhere. It's what you do for your transactions. Right. So they live in a cashless And this is 2017. <clears throat> exactly. Right. I thought it was funny how after he's arrested, he gets a court-appointed theatrical agent. Yeah. Because it's all theater funny. anyway. It's all theater, yeah. And politics is all theater. theater yeah. And they're actors, but just not as good, right? Mm-hmm. And... I'm thinking of even actors who become politicians like Jesse Ventura or Ronald Reagan or, you know, the list goes on and on right. because it's all the same thing. Yeah. Pattern after Soviet Nazi style governments, the film presents a police state situation where children and citizens report others for infractions of the rules. And what this does is it turns into a system to destroy people. And what's, other the other amazing aspect of this film is the presentation of staged and fake hoax news so the beginning is of course ben richards the arnold schwarzenegger character uh, won't kill a bunch of innocent civilians so what does the state do they frame him and create a fake news story that he's the one that killed them Uh, then they turn around in the midst of the uh, gladiatorial event they create a fake news story that he was killed. And they use crisis <laughs> actors on the news. And they use crisis actors on the news, yeah. So uh, kind of a wag the dog style scenario too. Um, but, you know, this this is a, a very revealing uh, dystopian film that probably technically doesn't count as a B-movie. But I thought it would be fun to include it in our B-movie. It has the same similar themes for, for our B-movie selections. Tell me, did you get any more notes on that? No, it was fun. It was an Arnold movie. For How sure. many glugs does it get? I'll give it three and a half glugs. Three and a half, half glugs and and two two, two red weight vines. two weight bars for Arnold. <laughs> <Father. laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely. If you've never seen the 1987 Running Man, go out and see it because most importantly, there's a fat guy who sings opera who's one of the gladiators. And his suit is made of light bright. Don't miss that. <laughs> light bright, very eighties. 
Uh, so let's see what we've got next. All right, the next film is the Oscar Academy Award winning Ghoulies. This is the 1984, definitely a B-movie, that centers around Jonathan Graves, a young man who uncovers his late father's occult paraphernalia in their family mansion. Graves tries to summon up demonic forces that his father dabbled with in the hope of gaining supernatural powers. As a result, Ghoulies arrive who look like uh, they were tossed out of um, Jim Henson's puppet pile. <laughs> these, are the, these are the retards from Jim Henson's puppet puppets. Yes, the ghoulies are goofy, for sure. Now, and then the ghoulies arrive to descend upon the manor and terrorize everyone who participate in this ritual. Uh -huh. But what's interesting about this is that it kind of has some real ritual stuff. It does. It stays really close to um, ritual magic, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it's really fun because it's kind of like Gremlins B movie, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's kind of what uh, what Mac and me is to E. T. <laughs> Ghoulies is to Gremlins. That's a good analysis. <laughs> Although Ghoulies is not really an ad for anything, but Mac and me is about a, basically an hour and a half long ad for McDonald's. That's true. The stuff. I think that maybe there's an esoteric connection that we could tie the stuff in with Mac and me that mm -hmm. the stuff turns you into Mac and me. Well, maybe the goo is from Mac and me's home planet. Well, if you remember in Mac and me at the beginning, they stick straws into their planets and they drink Coke <laughs> yes, they do. out of it. And then when they come to Earth, they want Coke from mm -hmm. McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another. So here, there we go. There's two films probably more with the theme that the junk that is replaced food is alien in origin. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But these ghoulies are, um, uh, ritual magic demonic beings. Right. And I think it's interesting because the movie starts out with a scene of a ritual taking place and it's complete with this huge pentagram behind the altar. Mm-hmm. And um, they've got the real goetic sigil of Belial on the mantle. Right, which is real. Yeah. Right, so Belial's a pretty high-ranking demon who's actually mentioned, you know, more than 20 times in the Bible, um, <clears throat> uh, up there with Lucifer and Satan. Right. And <laughs> Belial is the 68th spirit um, in the Key of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And it says he was created next to Lucifer and, and is of his order from the Key of Solomon. Yes, one of the, the name means liar, mm -hmm. accusing liar. Mm -hmm. And so if you look it up in that book, it says his purpose is to distribute political power and give familiars like the ghoulies. And the ghoulies are the familiars. Yep. And so it says he must be... They, a, they rode the short bus from Jim Henson <laughs> Studios over to <laughs> Ghoulie <laughs> Studios at... At uh, B movie pictures or whoever Empire Pictures, but um, Belial it says it must be appeased by gifts and sacrifices. Right. 
and the ritual that takes place in the beginning is surprise surprise a child sacrifice so mm, yeah exactly the grand wizard is up there and he commands one of the women in the cult to bring the baby forth right and she disobeys and she says no not our baby so that's the mother right there in the cult and she puts this protective talisman on the baby which um uh, thwarts his uh, attempt to sacrifice the baby mm-hmm and so the wizard gives it to this other cult member who was that guy from Twin Peaks. Yeah, Jack Nance, mm-hmm. the David Lynch regular, is who's pretty much the only star in the film, <laughs> ends up being the good wizard, right? Uh huh. And so he um, <clears throat> he takes the baby away, and the the grand wizard's like, "Well, you're gonna take his place." So there's the death of the mother right there, in the right. beginning of the movie, which good I point. always talk about. So then years later, um, this like quote unquote young college boy he looks about 35 but he's supposed to be in college mm-hmm. and he comes into possession of this mansion and he sets out to explore the mansion and every room they go in is like full of occult paraphernalia yeah, right. and upside down pentagrams everywhere right and at one point they even take out the book of a and the mage which is a real magic book mm-hmm. right and so then, bit by bit, he begins to um, experiment with the dark arts there in the house. And he's trying to know what his father's all about. So the knockoff dark arts. Yeah. So there's some generational Satanism. Uh, yeah, right? that is what the, the film's about, mm-hmm. correct? And so he goes down and, and discovers the ritual chamber and starts to do spells that pretty much give him like immediate power that he can call upon. I like his sexy swinging friend and who his, his he has the dick the only good line in the film is they call me dick but you can call me dick <laughs> yes what she says when he's trying to pick up the chick mm-hmm. yeah so he actually uses his friends in the ritual at right. one point and his eyes glow green and they like the googly green eyes i guess indicate his alignment with the dark forces Right. Yeah, that's weird because a lot of films will present green eyes for some reason as hmm. satanic. I don't oh, know really? why, but uh, you see it, for example, in Big Trouble in Little China mm-hmm. and a lot of others. Uh, it's a pattern I've noticed. I mean, it could just be artistic license, but yeah, there it... could be some other significance to the, you know, what's the significance of green in, in color magic or right. whatever. Right, good point. So they have this dinner party uh, where he and his friends attempt to conjure up something instead of <laughs> playing Trivial Pursuit or something. He's like, let's do a ritual. Strip poker. Yeah. That one guy says, uh-huh. strip poker. Mm-hmm. And so they do this ritual that's pretty close to a, a pentagram banishing ritual. Right. And um, they don't close it, so they open it up, and then the ritual's interrupted by the guys. They don't. You know, when they're not taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. So he's like, um, wait, I have to dismiss the spirit. And the the guy's like, so do I, man. Where's the bathroom? Now, my favorite part is when Willow and his girlfriend show up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he gets some little minions, right? Are they familiars, too? So well, okay. You get a, it's not kind of like a role-playing the... <laughs> game. So you get, like, dwarves and warriors and elves and... The ghoulies are what, in magic, you would call elementals. Right. And they come out... Because one's for water, one's earth. Yeah, right. I know. And then... Um, <laughs> we're the dual midget. Yeah, couple. so he continues to hone his magical abilities, and he's, like, setting up his proper magician's altar, and he's got the blade, the wand, and the chalice, and the pentacle, all... This is, like, textbook ritual magic right. in the movie. Mm-hmm. And um, so his powers grow, and then he successfully summons these two imps, right? And this is a very um, Faustian scene. It is. Which is the famous German legend about the magician who makes a pact with the demon Mephistopheles um, to serve him in life, and then when he dies, he will serve the demon. And so this is illustrated in um, Manly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. He actually Mm -hmm. has a big painting. Um, where you can see the magician in his uh, protective circle and Mephistopheles you there. Mean Yoda. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so this is just like those two midgets that he 
brings forth mm-hmm. to do his bidding. But this is why, well, Manly P. Hall says this is why the <clears throat> black sorcerers will try to prolong their life as much as possible because they have pledged that if these beings serve them in this life, that they'll serve them in the next life. Yeah, the midgets that do my bidding are lazy. They just lay around <laughs> and don't do anything. So, uh, <laughs> the, the guy, Jonathan, he gets so powerful that he's able to summon rain on command with the demon Ashtroth. Mm-hmm. And that's another real demon, right? And then um, what's funny is the scene where they're all eating dinner and the ghoulies are in the food, but no one can see them except for him. You remember yeah, that? Yeah, ghoulies and food. Mm-hmm. Demonic food, once yep. again. <laughs> Black magic, demon food. And then, Genetically modified. Exactly. And then his friends, well, he takes them down and, and uses them in another ritual, and they accidentally resurrect his zombie grand wizard dad. Right. And then Jack Nance shows up to save the day. Right. Well, um, the dad shows up, the zombie dad, and he takes command of the ghoulies because he outranks the sun and he is the one who summoned the ghoulies in the first place. And um, so he starts to get his power back by siphoning off the life force of the party goers. Mm -hmm. Right? Just like he tried to do with his son in the beginning. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, one by one, the ghoulies attack the house guests and spill the sacrificial blood and rejuvenate him until he's all powerful again. And then, like you said in the end, um, the Jack Nance guy comes to save the day. Exactly. Yeah. And that's because he has blue velvet David Lynch powers. Yep. He can show up and resolve the situation. Now, so, uh, what do you... I felt like so far this was the worst <laughs> of the movies. I mean, it's fun, but it uh, quality-wise, it's the worst. Yeah, you have to kind of be in the goofy mood yeah, to or enjoy it. Have several drinks <laughs> and yeah. friends around. Yeah. So very mystery science theater three thousand. If you want to check out Ghoulies, but there is a few interesting things. I give it two glugs of butter and one uh, ghoulie popping out of the toilet. How many goat skulls do you give? How many goat skulls? Yeah. Mm, are they candy goat skulls? Yeah. If I lift them up, is there Pez underneath? <laughs> I give it. Uh, I give it two goat skulls with glugs of butter running down the skull. Uh, oh, okay. Yum. What do you give it? Um, I'll give it three goat skulls. Okay. Yeah. So that concludes Ghoulies, and now we're gonna move on. Uh, but if you've been listening to what you've heard so far, this is the first half of Esoteric Hollywood, this episode, B-Movies with a message, fun with B-Movies. Uh, if you like what you hear, go to jasonalysis.com and subscribe for four ninety five a month or the option of $60 per year, and you get full access to all the interviews, talks, lectures, and so forth. A lot of fun educational material there that you can't get anywhere else, and you can get my book as well, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film available from Trine Day Publishers. It will be out in a month, but you can go ahead and pre-order that. And you can also get Jamie Hanshaw's book, Hollywood Mind Control. You'll see the images at Jay's Analysis that you can click on to order that book as well. So thank you for listening and stay tuned for hour two and subscribe. This is the ghost of Donald Pleasance. You're listening to Jay's Analysis. The next film will be John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, and starring myself as the apostate Roman priest. Please keep listening to Jay's analysis, endorsed by the ghost of Donald Pleasance. There's a whistling in my cheat, and the whistle that you hear is the sound of the bells of your doom.